Are you in a band? Are you an entertainment entrepreneur? Are you a musician, songwriter, or producer? Or are you wanting to start a career in the music industry? If so, then this podcast is for you. On the Do That Music Thing podcast, we'll be interviewing subject matter experts, artists, and other leaders in the music industry to identify actionable strategies to move you forward in your career, spark some inspiration, and at the least, just have some fun talking about music. So let's get to it and do that music thing. Good morning and welcome to another awesome episode of the Do That Music Thing podcast, where we talk to individuals in and around the music industry to find out actionable ways to move your career forward and get that success that you want. And today I have an awesome guest, awesome guy, um, transitioned out of the music industry and into songwriting. And he has such an incredible story. Uh, Bradley Collins, welcome to the show. Oh man, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Oh, well, you know, we're, we're glad to have you. And uh, Bradley and I met through NSAI, where we were teamed up as co-writers through the director of membership, Jill Moody. I'm a huge fan of NSAI. It's, you know, really brought me in contact with a lot of awesome people. And one of the awesome people is you, sir. <laughs> well, thank you. The feeling is is mutual my relationship with nsai has has changed a lot over the years but um as far as doing um doing the work that songwriters need which is co-writes and listening to music um jill and bart and their team are absolutely the best that's, that's been in that building while i've been in, on music row yeah they're, they're fantastic folks over there well let's go ahead and dig into it um you know one thing that really fascinates me about your story is that you were a music executive. You were working for BMI, and now you are a songwriter. So go ahead and tell us about this story, how, you know, what brought you to the music industry and what brought you to BMI. Let's start there. Yeah, man, absolutely. Well, I was born and raised in Nashville. Um, I grew up in and around the music business, my grand, my dad was a uh, independent music publisher and Grammy nominated record producer. So I was around it my my entire life. My first job, I was mowing grass at publishing companies, and uh, on Thursdays or Fridays, they let me come in and actually do reel to reel tapes and DAT transfers. If you remember what DATs are, and uh, I just always was around music, and I loved it. Started playing drums, started playing guitar, started playing bass. I was in a bunch of bands. And being in Nashville, you're around a bunch of kids whose parents are all musicians. So grew up with some really good players and uh, just kept getting internships anywhere, anywhere I, I could. My first big one was at Echo Froze Music. I was 17 and I was doing Hank Williams Senior Copyright Renewals. And that really got me, got an appetite for music publishing and how, how that worked. And then, you know, I'd, I'd go and hang out with the songwriters whenever I could to see what they were writing. Cause I always wanted to hear what was, what was next and what was going to be released that I hadn't, hadn't heard yet. But then I went to, went, went to college, majored in journalism is the most creative thing I could do without being an English major and returned back to Echo Froze. And at that point, their roster, was like the New York Yankees of songwriting. They had Dean Dillon, Casey Beathard, Whitey Schaefer, Skip Ewing. And I was just able to immerse myself with those writers, get to know how they wrote songs. While I was a catalog manager, listening to every single song that was turned in. Um, but nine months prior to that, I had applied for a job at BMI and I didn't get it. It was a creative job, an assistant job, I think. And uh, they just, I just didn't interview well, or they didn't have the opening. And during those nine months, I was at Echo Bros. I air quote accidentally on purpose, kept running into the head of BMI, Paul Corbin at that time, showing him that I was out meeting people, introducing him to songwriters. And he's like, well, Echo Bros is being sold to Sony. We have a spot for you here. And I was 24 at that point, And I landed the job that I I've wanted for forever, which was a creative rep at um, BMI. And then that lasted 16 years. And, uh, you know, it was 
I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how industry works, how songwriters work, what songwriters uh, want to hear, what they need to hear, and uh, got to work with a lot of people way early on in their careers. And the good thing is a lot of them remember the fact that, you know, you take a meeting with them or you make a connection for them or you show up to their first number one party. So that was a, a great job for, for 16 years. That's awesome. So you were a creative rep for, for how long? 16 years. I started off as a associate director, rose to executive director, and that job entailed meeting new songwriters when they came to came to town. A lot of times I was their first point of contact. So I had to dis dispel a lot of industry rumors and fears and really listen to people's music and point them to places like NSAI or to showcases, to ride arounds, to any, any other kind of um, opportunities that I felt could further them. Oh, so you were essentially a writer's best friend. <laughs> that's what I wanted to be, you know, that's what I wanted to be. And you meet with lots of people. And uh, yeah, I always said, I, I can help everybody. I may not be able to help them the way they want to be helped, but I can help everybody. And I really tried to do that. Um, and I, I, I hear it all the time um, from writers just, well, hit me up on Twitter t thanking me for a meeting they I set up for them or listening to their songs when they knew no one needed to listen to their songs and they're embarrassed now but um no it was a lot of meeting people early on in their careers when they were really trying to find a find a friend and I, I tried to be that for them how would you describe a day in the life of a creative rep for some of our listeners out there who might want to get involved in the business end of songwriting that, you know, once you be a, a creative rep, give us a breakdown of what the day to day looks like. Well, a lot of it was filled with writer meetings. You know, I, I tried to fill my mornings with meetings with people that wanted to come play songs or needed to start a publishing company or needed to sign up to BMI. Um, but, to me, the thing that, that you have to look at is there's ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. And just like we all love guitars, there's Gibson, Fender, and PRS guitars, right? So they all do the same thing. They just all do it a little bit differently. And finding your fit at which PRO is just simple as going and getting a meeting there and seeing if you um, feel at home because – end of the day, these are the people that are your, your, your livelihood. And um, question I get a lot is when is it the right time to sign up for a PRO? And that's pretty simple. It's whenever you decide you, you want to make money because they're the people that pay you whenever you decide you want to, you know, figure out if this music thing is, is, is for you and how you're going to make a livelihood out of it. That's when you go sign with one. And I would, you know, if it was me, I'm signed to BMI, but I would, if I was not, if I was Muter Town, I'd go meet with every single one, all three of them, somebody in their creative department, and uh, see which ones dig, dig my music the most. I feel like a lot of songwriters, especially ones that are, you know, early on in their career, might find that process kind of intimidating. You know, how easy is it for someone to get in touch with a creative rep at a PRO? That's a good question, you know. I hear that it's getting more and more difficult. Um, but I think if you're persistent and level headed that you can get in. Um, and it's just a matter of, you know, going to the same industry events that everyone else goes to and getting a referral from a friend that knows somebody. Um, we used to do walk-ins at BMI where you could actually walk in and get a meeting. But um, with the way the world is right now, they've, they've stopped that. Um, but, you know, getting out, knowing who you want to meet with and setting a goal to meet with them and, and you can do it. I'm hearing this reoccurring theme of networking. And I know that that can be kind of a taboo word for, for creative folks, but, uh, I, you know, I'm from Nashville and been attached to the music industry in some form or fashion for as long as I've been alive. And that has always been the most effective way to move a career forward. So, you know, what type of networking strategies would you want to give a songwriter who's looking to grow their career? The best thing to do is go to write arounds. So I know that sounds simple, but 
you don't have to be playing to go to one. And what you want to do is network with other writers and get co-writes and make connections because you're building a catalog. I describe it as, you know, you look at somebody like a Sony, they probably have every single song that I will have written this week in some form or fashion in that, in their catalog, right? But they don't have the song that I wrote with so-and-so artists that I've had 10 songs with that are going in to record five, they're gonna get two on an album, you know? So what you're doing is you're building a catalog and making yourself marketable by creating leverage. And you do that by writing and writing and writing. Co-writing is also one of the, I think one of the easiest ways to network. I come from the, the world of rock where co-writing, where songs and the artists aren't as separated as much as they are in country or, or poppets. You know, four, five, six people all in a room banging it out and we're co-writing together. So that was always kind of the biggest thing that in a rock band, we were very confused about, well, how do we network other than just go to shows and, you know, meet other people. But the creative process was very internal, where with songwriting, it is a means to go meet someone new. And that's fantastic. That's a wonderful, wonderful means of networking. You get to that's network and meet met. new folks. Yeah, that's how we met. But you get to create new material. You get to enhance your catalog. You get to potentially learn new skills from a more seasoned writer and you get to meet a new person and then that person shares your music and they introduce you to those folks so yeah I, i'm i'm the biggest fan of co-writing um, as a networking tool yeah it's something that you have to do anyways and it helps when you have an organization like nsai they can get you in rooms that you didn't know existed so that's another form of networking going to their events um PROs have events, have number one parties. Um, you need an invitation usually, but if you know if you know the right people, I bet you can get in. And uh, yeah, just going out and the, the lesson I had to learn early on at because there were so many events to go to is to be where I am, just be present where I am. And the conversation that I'm having is the most important conversation I'm having that day. And don't get lost into who I'm not talking to because it'll come back around. But just being patient, going to events, not overworking yourself because you can certainly do that. But the really the starting point is, is right arounds. Okay, PROs. What is your experience in the connection between PROs and publishers? I know that you, know, you join a PRO first as a songwriter and then people naturally want to be associated with the publisher. So what was your relationship like between the PRO and publishers? Well, first thing I'd say is it, when you join as a songwriter, join as a publisher too. Go ahead and get your publishing company started because you're going to get asked about that probably in your next co-write. Um, my relationship to publishers were I, I had to know every publisher and I still do because if I met a songwriter and I knew so-and-so publisher was looking for that kind of writer, I wanted to connect them because I felt like my job was connecting songwriters to opportunities in order for them to write full time that all they had to worry about was writing. So I made a real statement that I had to know every publisher in Nashville in order to best serve whatever writer walked into the room. So the writers to me um, and the publishers were the same type of re relationship and needed the same kind of attention. All right, so let's move into a little bit of a more meaty subject. You were at BMI for a very, very long time, and you made the decision to transition out of that role and be a songwriter. I, I, I want to hear about this. I want to know yeah, yeah. the how, the why, and, and what prompted you to make that move. Well, short answer to that, Chris, I was, I was fired <laughs> and that's, there's no other way. There's no other way around it. Uh, it was really shocking because I had had the best year of, of my career. Artists I brought in that year are literally dominating the global charts right now. The songwriter, the BMI songwriter of the year that year, I had signed 10 years before everything was going great. And I got passed over for a promotion. 
person that took the job that I, that I was going for then asked me to explain to them how I signed 60% of BMI's roster. I mean, I had signed 60% of the writers we had. And I was like, there's no honest answer for that. It's just something that you gain by meeting with songwriters, meeting with publishers, meeting with producers, working with them so they trust you. And then you listen to catalogs and catalogs and catalogs of music. So you can tell a difference between something that's really great and something that's just the best of what you've heard lately. And I was like, there's not a, there's not an answer for that. And I was labeled as a lone wolf. I was labeled as um, uh, not a team player and I was let go. And it was really a tough time for me. It was really tough because I, I made BMI too much of a priority in, in my life, but also the way it happened, it was really, really hurtful. Um, but I, I, I rebounded from that and I started a um, publishing company with some friends and unfortunately COVID dissolved that we, we, we ended it. But how I got into songwriting is that I was sitting on, on my couch and I knew I didn't want to go into a corporate job again. Um, 16 years of that, I didn't want to do it. I liked publishing, but it wasn't really working. And I had just gotten my commercial real estate license on March 1st, 2020, uh, the worst possible time to get a commercial real estate license. And I was sitting there and I was thinking, you know, if it's all over today, what would I want to do? And, you know, songwriting came to me and I was like, why? I've talked people out of this for 15 years. Like, why do I want to do this? I, I, joke i didn't really talk people out of it but you know i know how difficult it is i look at it as covid was awful you'll never tell me covid was not the worst thing that a lot of us have experienced the silver lining to covid was quarantine and that was an absolute blessing and i knew that if i walked out of quarantine doing the same shit i had done before that i was had no one to blame but myself and I was like, if it's all over tomorrow, what do I want to have tried? And it was songwriting. And I had this voice inside me that had been digging at me for, I swear to you, 10 years that I needed to be doing something else. And it really sank me and it really got me very depressed, especially after I got fired, uh, sank into a clinical de de depression because this voice wouldn't stop telling me that I needed to do something else. And once I set up my first co-write, that voice that was so awful and sank me in so many different ways, just slowly went away and it hasn't been back. And that's how I got into songwriting because I felt like I had finally figured out what was going to make me happy. And that's writing songs. That is the most beautiful transformation story I've ever heard um, <laughs> in the oh, thanks, music man, industry. Thanks. That's incredible. And I think a lot of people are really going to relate to that feeling. You know, that's kind of what happened to me in quarantine where, you know, I'd spent, I left music, I left touring and joined a, a had a corporate marketing position and I've grown that career over the last 10 years or so. And quarantine hit and I also had a child right uh, mm -hmm. in April of 2020. So wow. a ton of personal reflection on top of, am I setting a good example for my daughters? Yeah, your whole, whole perspective changed. Oh yeah, and, and the quarantine was just the, the little little flip of the switch that, that I needed to make that internal transition to wanna to make music a priority again, the creation of music a priority. And there's really nothing that compares to that in, in my opinion you know get, getting to work with incredible people create something that's never been heard before um it's really i don't know if soul serving is the correct term but um mm -hmm. it's very soul serving and it feels very just makes it more complete makes life more complete but that's that's incredible so now that you're writing songs how has that past career helped you? Has it hindered you? How has it affected your move to being a songwriter? Yeah, well, it, it's, it's, you have different relationships with people, just like I, as I mentioned earlier, my relationship with NSAI is different than it ever was. Uh, um, 
where they're, they're more of a um, resource than a um, trade association. Um, but how it has impacted me as far as writing is, you know, Nashville is a different, is a town where you have to prove yourself. And even being at BMI for as long as I had and the amount of people that I worked with and know, by no point, but at no point did I ever think that I was entitled to anything. And I've really done a, a, a job, a close job of looking at what successful songwriters I had met with, what they did. And the first thing is don't skip steps. So as much as I would love to write with Tim Nichols, we'll write one day when it makes sense for Tim and when it makes sense for me. But I've done what I've been done now is I've told all my hit writer friends that I'm writing songs. So they know what I'm doing. Just tell them some of them have offered to write. Some of them haven't, but you know, the secret to Nashville is that saying you're writing songs. And then the minute you have an ounce of success, these people are going to want to write with you immediately. <laughs> so I've just really left the door open, not applied a, a lot, lot of pressure on people. And uh, I've just really focused on finding my voice as a songwriter. Same thing with publishers. I let my publisher friends know what I'm doing. A few of them have asked to hear songs and I send them to them, but I'm not beating down their doors because I know my songs aren't where I want them to be yet, but I'm also not hiding them. So it's just being patient, knowing that there's steps to be taken, celebrate the little victories. Like I, would you know, I used to go to the Bluebird Cafe as a, as a BMI rep and just dread it. And I don't know why. I think it's because I wasn't more of a part of what was happening there when I look back because I would just burn inside when I was there. But the first time I had one of my songs played at the Bluebird Cafe, you would have thought it was Nissan Stadium, man. I was the most excited. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, this, this, this amazing venue my words and my feelings are in this room right now. And it was, it was awesome. Um, so those, those are things that I've just, I've just seen other writers do um, and just applied it to what my story is, what, what my path is. I think it's so commendable that you, you are taking a very low pressure slash highly ethical but always moving forward approach. Um, and the fact that you were in the industry for so long, I think it's interesting. I, I think a lot of people, people's impression, uh, I get it too, um, from being in rock music for so long, that no, I had to start over from scratch. You have um, to humble yourself. You have to. And you have to let yourself be humbled because, you know, the voice where you get the songs from, you know, it's on its own timetable. It's not sitting there being like, okay, well, you've already done this. So I'm going to give you these ideas. Well, if you don't know what to do with the ideas, you're not going to be able to do anything with them. You know? So um, I appreciate you saying that because I've really tried to take a patient approach to what I'm doing. And again, just not skipping steps because I've seen it not, not work with people. You know, I could go write a song with uh, so-and-so hit songwriter and it'll probably be a good song, but what's it going to do unless I have a great idea to take into them and I can add my, my voice to it. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a slope. You really want to want to walk carefully. Let's talk about your personal process in songwriting. You, know, you mentioned those ideas and bringing those ideas up. Let's talk about that process for you. What is it like from ideation to writing, co-writing, completion, and demo if needed. What does that process look like for you, Bradley? Um, uh, well, songwriting process is my favorite thing that I that I do, um, and it's different every single time. Usually, I, I walk in with three uh, ideas, and I'm not married to the ideas. It's either a a verse or a chorus or something interesting, and I bring that in, and we either write that to, that day or we write about whatever we talked about. Um, the hour before we actually got started writing. Um, but my, my process is really, I just spend time with myself. I'm a devout meditator and I just get an idea and I 
I sit on it and I hold it and I figure out what is this saying? What is this supposed to be? What is this? Um, how can I turn this and turn it into something that can help people? Um, I found a lot of my writing uh, is very um, life affirming, very um, positive. Um, you know, I, I guess if there was one thing I could say that just I always try to remember when I come up with an idea or direction of a song is how is how do I want this out in the world? You know, how do I want this to impact people? How do I want this to impact the one listener it might have or however many listeners it might have? And what messages do I want to want to send? Because um, I, I, I do feel like um, song, songwriting is a is a uh, absolute privilege. And, uh, you know, you get to put your ideas and your words and your stories on paper and hope that they impact people to the way that they impacted you. I'll, I'll commend you because the first write that we did was uh, the title of the song, I think was called Things Are Going to Work Out Fine. And I'm like, this oh, yeah. is so refreshing. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, once again, I come from the rock world and I typically try and take that dark approach. And then I know that the whole joke with publishers is like, Ugh, another ballad, uh, another sad ballad. So um, I, I love that concept that you're coming into it from a really positive approach uh, and I think that can help a lot of people you know when they're, when they're going into co-writes or just going to sit down and they have an idea really think about it from a, a positive viewpoint um, and you'd be surprised what'll come out of it yeah well I think that's that's just how, how I how I operate um, you know from the right what you know mentality you know I don't know a lot about um, dirt roads and trucks, but I, I know a lot about love and loss and, um, disappointments and, you know, picking yourself up, you know? So that's what I, that's what tends to show up most in, in, in my songs, you know, the lines or ideas that I, I get in. So once you have found, or you and your co-writers have found that a song is quote unquote done, uh, how important is it for you to transition that into a demo? Well, I think it depends on what the what the song is, you know, if it's something for an artist, then we'll usually get a better recording than just what was in, in the room. Um, but if it's something that I write with my songwriter friends, you know, uh, pure, pure songwriters, a work tape will, will suffice until we uh, can re revisit it and see what really pops out. Um, I've never been an advocate, even when I was at BMI, of spending a lot of money on um, demos because it's it's a snapshot in time, you know, and you can save that money for when you have a little more of the picture, you know, when you see where, where it's going and where you want it to go. Um, so that's my I mean that's my approach to to demos, which is really not spending a lot of money because you don't have to. I have a huge problem with that where I finish a song and I'm like, I want to go demo it right now. And I've had to learn to reel that back. And like, you know, what matters most is the essence of the song, right? The story, the lyrics, the melody, is that coming across? And, and you're right. Um, that can get the job done. Cause if you're a songwriter, you're not the artist. Um, so I think maybe take that time and then, that you would have invested on a demo, right? And in, in money and invest that back into your, your songwriting craft. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's what, what, what are you pitching towards? You know, that's, that's what you really, really need to ask yourself. You know, are you pitching for a publishing deal? Work tapes will work as long as they're clear. Um, pu publishers hear work tapes every single day. If you're pitching for a, a, a cut or a single, then you need to have a little more of the picture done. Um, and then of course, if you're pitching towards, um, uh, radio or, um, DSPs, then you need to have, have your songs in a final form, um, uh, very well pre produced and sounding right. So it just depends on what you're pitching towards also. So 
as a ex music industry executive and now a songwriter, that has to have shaped not only how you you know create music, but how you listen to music. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. You know, how how do you personally listen to music, and you know, what's kind of shaped that experience for you? Yeah. Well, having a father that was a record producer and publisher. Um, one of the things I learned from him early on is how to listen to music. And I didn't have to like everything and I didn't have to dislike everything, but I needed to have a reason why I liked it or disliked it. So early on, I learned to say, you know, I really liked the, that, that verse coming out of the second chorus, you know, or I really loved the way that guitar sounded, or I, I didn't like that bridge. And I had to be able to talk about it and you know that's probably when i was 10 or 12 years old that i learned to be able to talk about music so that helped me talk to songwriters talk to musicians talk to producers publishers at a very early age and that's something that i've i've carried with me but now listening to music as a songwriter and chris i'd argue i've always been a songwriter <laughs> this is not just some new pursuit when i was four years old i told my mom i wanted to write songs and I was kind of one of those secret artists my, my entire career at BMI. Um, but I listened to it pretty much the same way. You know, I, I, I listened to it in a more honest way because I'm not listening to it and then running the liner notes in my head of who are the publishers and producers on it. I go and look and see who the producer is, especially if I like a track but I'm listening to how they took the idea now and how they hooked it or how they explained a feeling and how it start, went from a ending point, uh, from a starting point to ending point. So it's more of a creative listening approach to it as, as opposed to a industry approach to it. Having musicians or creatives as parents is a really unique experience. Both of my parents were musicians. My father was a jazz, is a jazz horn player. Uh, my mother is a classically trained uh, soprano who then did a few country records. So it's incredible what your family and even friends can teach you about music and how to interpret it. Um, you know, my father being the jazz guy, um, really taught me to appreciate melody regardless of if it was coming from a voice or from an upright bass or from a horn. Mm -hmm. um, that melody can weave itself in and out uh, of a song. Uh, you know, and, and my mother just showing me the impact and power uh, and appreciation of powerful voices um, because she has one of the most incredible voices I've ever heard. But it, it's, it's a privilege and it's really, uh, it's, it's an absolute gift to grow up, I think, in a musical home. Yeah, absolutely it is. You know, I had a great resource there um, with, with my dad. You know, we, we, we tended to listen to more Motown music than anything else because my parents both loved Motown. So I learned a lot about R&B and um, blues and that those genres from him. Um, and then I really got into country on my own i remember listening to alabama's greatest hits vol, vol volume two on cassette tape and just you know sitting there on my bed just crying being like whoa these songs are amazing why do i feel like this why you know why are these songs hitting me this way and, and um you know i kind of got into country on, on my own that, that that way but i also had a a a, a foundation of um parents that supported me um to be uh, a musician, you know, and I was, I was a drummer, you know, so, you know, my parents really had to <laughs> support me if I was going to be banging drums throughout the house. I think when the Metallica Black album came out, they told me to stop some, but, um, you know, beyond that, it was the, absolutely the very, very supportive of my music passion. I'm sure in 93 or 92, you had a, a double kick pedal on your Christmas wish list. I had a DW double kick pedal. I had platinum Zildjian cymbals and a pearl black export kit with black um, 
uh, heads on the bottom of it, just like Lars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had no idea. Metallica is one of my like all time favorite bands. Um, I didn't know we had that in common. <laughs> Oh yeah, man! I'm a, I'm a I'm a huge Metallica fan. You know the Binge and Purge block box set. I think about every Christmas. Um, it was just a, a a very impactful band on me, and something that I could find the art and the beauty in in, in metal music. You know that's really what Metallica did. It's it's absolutely incredible combination of heavy metal and art. Um, that's that's hard to replicate. It's funny because. I think that that's where my appreciation for songwriting really started was in Justice for All. I heard mm -hmm. one and from the opening credits where you're hearing the either that the sounds of war, there's explosions and screaming yeah. and it immediately was like this is a story. This is going to suck me in and I followed that story. I ended up reading that book Johnny Got His Gun, you know, by Dalton mm -hmm. Trumbo. Yeah, it's the song that's based off of the story. Um, and then, no joke, I think I immediately, and I don't know how it ended up in my possession, but I got a cassette of Montgomery Gentry's, oh gosh, it was the album that had Hillbilly Shoes, Daddy Won't Sell the Farm. Yeah, the first album. Yeah. yeah that was the first and, album. Uh, there's a song, Tattoos and Scars. Yeah. And I remember as a 12 year old, I kind of had the same experience with you. Like I was, I had the cassette, was listening to that song on my bed and I just started crying. Like, I just was like, man, these songs, like this song is incredible. And that's what started my, I think, appreciation, real appreciation uh, for country music and for songwriting and how impactful it can be. Yeah, man. I mean tattoos and scars tony lane song i mean he's one of my favorites and it's it was it's awesome to see that um songs like like uh, like that can hit you the way that they that they do and that the songwriter's voice come comes through um but yeah that's a, that's a great record really great record speaking of uh, of great records what are you listening to right now you know what songwriters should people start to investigate or what artists should people start to investigate that you know you're really digging right now man I, i'm kind of all, all over the place honestly it's my my spotify wrapped just came out today so we all know how how how, how big that is I, I really like hardy i just flew back on a on a from a flight to la and he was right next to me and he got to spend some time with him his song um a, a rock just absolutely blows me away and uh, big things are in store for him. Um, really love uh, the War on Drugs. Um, I think they're a, just a really transcending type band. That their their music is going to be around a long time. Uh, listen to Adele. I love everything Adele does. It's just absolutely amazing what she can do with that instrument, meaning her 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 voice. And honestly, this sounds like a cop out, but it's true. It's like my favorite music is the music I haven't heard before. And that's why I think I was able to be successful at BMI because I always wanted to hear what was new. I wanted to turn over every single rock. I wanted to hear every work tape somebody wanted to send me, which is something else is like, is there a greater compliment in Nashville with someone asking you to listen to their music? There really isn't. I mean, if you say, Will you please listen to my music and for you not to have time to that or worse, I've had people ask me to listen to my music and they never get back to me. And it was their request. It's just incredible. The fact that somebody wants to play for you, what they have been toiling over in their mind and agonizing over, I guess, a blank sheet of paper and they want you to hear it. And the least you can do is say, I like it or I don't. And why? Man, uh, Bradley, thank you so much uh, for being on the Do That Music Thing podcast. The last thing we do on every episode, and it's personally, it's my favorite, where we ask our guest to provide three actionable items 
that someone can do in the music industry today to move their career forward. Um, can be big, can be small. Go for it. Let us know. What are your three? Well, the first thing I do, I'd say, is remain a fan of music. I feel like it's really easy to get caught up into getting backstage and VIP privileges and, you know, the hang backstage and you never know what's happening at front of stage. What I've done over the years is I've allowed myself to be a music fan. Like this summer, I'm going to a handful of dead company shows. I'm a huge John Mayer fan, bigger Jerry Garcia, Grateful Dead fan. Um, and I just love their music, but you know, I get online, I get in the queue I buy tickets. I'll be sitting in the middle of a row in the middle of a foot of a baseball stadium this summer, listening to dead and company. And that's really where I feel, um, music and inspiration hit me the hardest because I'm there because I want to be there, not because I can benefit from it. So, uh, remaining a fan of music is, is big for me. Second one I've already touched on. Um, but let me say, just run towards the fear, you know, sitting on my couch during, during quarantine, I was, I was scared. I had no idea what I was going to do because, you know, the publishing company I had, um, was being dissolved. Uh, I was out of a job I had been in for 16 years. Commercial real estate was a dead end for me at that point. And I was like, what in the world scares me? And I remember, um, Going back, I went to a, uh, an event and my buddy Tim Nichols was there. I'm bringing him up again, but this is, a, this is a true story. Tim was sitting there playing Live Like You're, you're Dying. And I, uh, I'm a huge Tim Nichols fan as a person and as a songwriter. And I was consumed with just this energy that I had to get away from him. And it wasn't because I was jealous. It wasn't because... I was um, annoyed or anything. I just knew somewhere inside of me that I should be doing that. I should be writing songs. And I was terrified. I'm like, no one's going to take me seriously. People are going to talk shit about me. People are going to have this opinion that I'm just doing this and it's not, I'm not, it's not being taken seriously. Well, you know, I learned that there's not a, a Thursday morning meeting where everyone in Nashville sits down and figures out how they're going to screw over Bradley Collins that week. You know, that just, that just doesn't exist. So I was like, I've got to run towards this fear. I've got to get, I've got to get past it. And the fear was writing songs and just getting going. Um, so that would be my second thing is listen to yourself, run and run towards the fear. And uh, the last thing is along those lines, get, get around what's blocking you. There is always a reason not to dream. There's always a reason to doubt yourself and figuring out what your passion is, is pursuing it, no matter what it looks like to you, is the best gift you can give yourself. I was meditating and I had this come to me when I was thinking about this very subject and um, the idea that just because no one you know has been on your path before, it doesn't mean it's not your path. And I was like, okay, I can, I can take that and say, I've not seen anybody from a PRO leave a PRO and um, the way I did and, be and become a successful songwriter. But you know what? I'm going to be the first one to do it. Um, so just getting around what's blocking you and knowing there's always a reason to not do something and telling that voice that they're wrong and to go away. Well, that is some super inspirational, super heavy, and super applicable items, Bradley. Um, Such really is my life. Thank you. <laughs> well, Bradley, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, forever appreciate. Um, you know, I think that you were, you may have been my second actual co-write from NSAI um, that was more focused around country and specifically songwriting. And uh, I am better for it and uh thank you so much for, for everything that you know you've provided me and that you're uh, providing the audience of this show so uh well, Bradley, thank you so thank, much thank you i'm better off for writing with you and love writing with you so 
looking forward to doing it again. And thank you so much for having me on. It was hopefully it's as beneficial for people listening as it was for me. It's good to get these things out. Awesome. Well, Brad, thanks you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Do That Music Thing podcast. To learn more about me, the host, Christopher Faust, you can catch me online at ChristopherFaust.com, on Instagram at ChrisFaustMusic, or on Twitter at ChrisJamesGTR. If you'd like to be a guest on the Do That Music Thing podcast, please feel free to email me at ChrisFaustMusic at gmail.com. If you're a fan of the show, head on over and leave us a five-star review. Thanks for listening. I'm Chris Faust. Let's go do that music thing. <laughs>